Right. Um, thanks very much, uh, Steve, for the invitation for something a little bit different. Um, the first thing you'll note is the word uh, historical account. This is not a scientific talk. This is a history talk. Um, what am I doing giving a history talk in the middle of a scientific session? Well, we just thought it would be interesting to do something a little bit different. I've spent 10 years recreating the discovery history of the Norilsk system. And I'm just going to share one or two interesting tidbits uh, with you today. So just for a reminder, this is a historical account. Um, one of the reasons why I was motivated to do this is because the story is has a number of conflicting elements in the Russian literature and in the English literature, especially in reviews that are really drawing on an element of hindsight bias from something that happened a long time ago now. So the vast majority of people associated with even the Talnak and Oktobriski discoveries have now passed away. So we're really dealing with a lot of secondary literature, including my own attempt here. Um, so as I mentioned, the, it's a 10 year project, it's several hundreds of references and a number of interviews that have gone into this. Um, and I'm, I'm a fair number of what I call primary interviews, which means interviews with people who were there at the time um, or direct translations of interviews with those who were there at the time. So let's uh, see where we can go. So this diagram shows you uh, a brief synopsis of the discovery of Norilsk into what I call three different phases. And, and what you're looking at there is time from uh, prehistory through to the present day and millions of metal tons in nickel equivalency. So nickel, copper and PG equivalency. So the history of Norilsk includes a prehistoric history of copper smelting, as I'll go into uh, an element of uh, discovery of coal, and then three major phases, which I call the prospecting phase, the shallow exploration phase with the discovery of Talnak, and the deep exploration phase with the discovery of Oktobriski. Those of you who know the geology better than me will know this is a, a simplification of the deposits, but for the sake of argument, uh, Norilsk one, Talnak and Oktobriski in three separate intrusions. The names that you can see there in red uh, refer to the really key individuals in the history. Uh, Alexander Sinitkov, uh, Nikolai Ovensev and Viktor Kravtsov. And again, there are many other people associated with those discovery, but in the space of 15 minutes, I'm really gonna draw attention to these three individuals and in particular, uh, to the discovery of Talnak and Oktobriski. So the story starts, because I need to set the scene just a little bit, um, back a thousand years BC, so 3000 years ago, what we know now from a number of archeological digs uh, from primary references is the presence of copper along the Northern Siberian coast in a series of, uh, of old villages and towns that are now buried. Um, there's been several recent theory, uh, uh, theses on this and in particular, the use of crucibles and uh, some very particular jewelry that has their copper source as now been directly associated with Norelsk. Um, the first real scientific study in this part of, the, of Siberia is from Alexander von Middeldorf, who was a German uh, who really uh, wrote an amazing book on his journey through to the Northeast of Siberia. Um, and he noted coal and copper along the way. Uh, Alexander is actually famous for um, the recognition in the Western literature of the woolly mammoth and, and the woolly mammoth plays a very important role in the uh, discovery or the eventual discovery of, of Norilsk as well. Um, so to have a look at the first phase before we get to Talnak, what we call the prospecting phase, um, people were first drawn uh, here in 1865 uh, to the discovery outcropping copper, massive sulphides, the first geologist came in here at Schmidt uh, with the very first assays shortly afterwards. And what's not commonly known, because this part of the discovery history is often uh, ignored, um, is that there were two uh, small mines developed just for copper production in the 1870s. Uh, and it's because of these copper, uh, small copper mines at Norilsk one itself that allowed Alexander Sinitkov to stake what becomes the Norilsk one deposit next to his grandfather. And an important element of this story, because this is somewhat obscured by history, is Sinitkov is a Cossack 
and he's going to fall onto the wrong side of the October Revolution. Uh, and his name is only just really being reinstated as the original discoverer of Arpnarilsk itself. Alexander gives his samples. He's a first year student. Some people say he's a second year student at the Tomsk Technological Institute. And he gives his samples to a third year student called Nikolai Vansev, who's the man who's credited with the discovery uh, of Norilsk and eventually receives the order of Lenin for his, uh, for his work. Um, the reason why this story is controversial is this all is all around the October Revolution and this particular part of Siberia is, is overrun and becomes a key part of the Red versus White Army story. And eventually Alexander is shot. And as a result, his name is somewhat obscured from the subsequent uh, history of the story. Um, there's been a number of recent historical accounts that are really reinstating uh, his role in the early work. Um, prior to Nikolai Ivansev. So this is an outcropping prospecting stage of, of the discovery. There's the um, original staking pole here from the Dogal history that really documents uh, Alexander's early role in this work. Um, this story really escalates when Nikolai Ivansev is asked to lead an expedition in 1919, 1920 um, to the north and Alexander Sinekov presents this work uh, to, in Petrograd on the copper occurrence. And you're looking at the cover of the report that he wrote uh, from that piece of work, recommending uh, the exploration expedition to the north. The real motivation for the discovery is actually uh, an interesting one. I mentioned woolly mammoths before. Two other things were really important. As the Soviet Union was starting to form, an important element was the northern seaboard which is really commanded and dominated by the Norwegians to the point where Roald Amundsen, who most of you will be aware is famous for the first man to the South Pole and for opening the Northwest Passage in Canada, he um, opened up the Northern Siberian route as well. Sadly, he lost uh, two men on that particular expedition and those two men were dropped off and forced to walk uh, from the Northern Siberian coast and one of them made it as far as the Dudinka River, which many of you all know is in the Norilsk region. And Nikolai was actually sent to find uh, those people, those men, uh, and eventually found the remains uh, on his journey towards uh, Norilsk in 1920. So interesting how all these stories all tie together. A famous man, Roald Amundsen and Nikolai Ivansev uh, joining together in somewhat. The second uh, expedition uh, through to 1922 is very well written and several uh, famous texts by, by, by Nikolai Vansev. But what's really famous is he's actually detained from leaving in this particular trip. And this is the beginning of the Norilag story or the Norilsk Gulag um, uh, from his detention uh, from leaving the original expedition. Um, I won't go into the Gulag story, but that's another story that's really emerged in the last decade, uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union, but increasingly in the last 10 years, um, we now have uh, numerous accounts of life, what it's like to be an engineer and a geologist in the, in the Norilag, and it's becoming increasingly uh, open knowledge in Russia. Um, the whole point of my story is not just to give you a, a blow by blow account, but I wanna also go through uh, the role of hydrogen chemistry. So 28 years prior to the discovery of Oktobriski, uh, surface-based stream hydrogeochemistry makes its first step. 1937, just prior to the Patriotic War, um, prospecting of surface streams was carried out in the Karolak area, uh, assayed only for nickel and sulfur. Um, the importance of this comes a little later. 20 years later, this data is really thoroughly looked at and it plays a role in the discovery of the subsequent deposits. Um, there's a huge prospecting story to tell through here, but I really dragged on just one example, 1958, uh, the emergence of this man, Viktor Kratsov. He gets transferred as a young 25 year old uh, to this pro uh, area to start exploring. Uh, several prospects are discovered, uh, but the importance of his role comes a little bit later on with the discovery of Dalnan. Um, you'll see the picture on the right, which is the classic, uh, globular sulfides that we're all very familiar with now. Uh, these boulders are found in the general vicinity of the Karolak Mountains. 
um, and they drive some of the initial drill holes, KZ1 to KZ5. Um, a lot of very good till geochemistry, but no one finds the source. Uh, fair amount of controversy at this point, a number of hypotheses, fair involvement of academics in this particular part of the story, but no one finds the source of these sulphide bearing boulders at this stage. Um, a new chief geologist is appointed um, in 1959 and he sets three geologists out on a hunt. And I'm going to take you through a little bit blow by blow, four days in their life. Um, senior geologist Victor Kratsov in the middle of Vasily Nesterovsky, and then a young graduate, Yuri Kitsnetsov, who's only 23 at this time. And these three men play the key role in the discovery of Talnak. Um, I just want to linger a little bit on the senior geologist Victor Kratsov here. Um, uh, Victor's recently died and uh, an important element of his story is his personal memoirs and his field diary from uh, the discovery period. And for any young geologists who are listening on the line, Victor's 27 when he makes the discovery of uh, a supergiant ore body. So uh, quite inspirational. And there's a, that photo on the top right is, is him and his, his, his older years. Um, this is a very bad photograph taken, uh, one or two of his pages of his field book um, with a blow by blow account. And what's amazing about this field diary is it isn't just geological descriptions, which you can see here, but it's really beautifully written prose and a really a reminder of what it's like to do field geology in such a beautiful part of the world. And I, I'm gonna directly grab some quotes from this field book because it's really as a collector's piece and a real cornerstone of this Dalnak story. So 9th of July, 1960, and in direct quotes here, just coming straight from the diary, at the foot of the Aldenaya mountain slope in the field of Punguska rocks, we discover a gabbro intrusion, which forms a ledge up to two meters high and is traced along the slope for a hundred meters. In appearance, the gabbro dolerite reminds us of the upper differentiates of the Norils type intrusions. Those intrusions we know now that are extremely well differentiated and very distinctive along the Norilsk Karolak Fault. And there's a photo of the three of them um, in those outcrops there um, with their hand lenses making field notebook. Day two, um, an example of the beautiful prose, no geology in this particular series of quotes, but on the 10th of July in the morning, having loaded a horse, tent and other simple belongings with backpacks over the shoulders and with geological hammers in hand, we set off along the foot of the Lesnaya Ridge to the Talnak River. The horse turned out to be surprisingly calm as if she knew where to go. Um, a nice little quote that's in there, they made camp at the end of the day, cooking dinner, railings caught right there in the river and a snack of alcohol as we sat down at the fire. And then the last little line there, further up the river in the opposite stream along a continuous field of basalts, we passed into the source of the stream and went down to the foot of the mountain. This brook is a wonderful place a picturesque waterfall 20 meters high with a lake under it. it really paints some beautiful prose. Um, day three, the cry of Vasily. There was a cry from Vasily who announced that he had discovered a block of gabbro dolerite. We found another outcrop. We converged in the middle of it and we started chipping off and through magnifiers examined the rock. We came to the conclusion that this was typical for the roof part of the ore bearing intrusions with small quantities of chalcopyrite and pyrite. This is the famous outcrop seven, which is the target KZ21. KZ21 becomes the discovery hole for Talnak. Um, what's famous about this particular part of Talnak in the upper contact in the Tunguskis is, is the presence of this very distinctive uh, uveritic chromium rich grossular garnet, which they noticed in outcrop and noticed uh, as presence as minerals and heavy minerals around the area. Very distinctive looking garnet in the exo contact aureole of, of, of these intrusions, of the non, of, uh, of the Talnak intrusion. So just a brief discovery of Talnak, uh, high sulfate in the water that was discovered many years early, mineralized boulders, and then the, the garnet. And KZ21 there, you know, four massive sulfide veins and 20 meters of massive sulfide. And, and a couple of photos that really give you an impression of just how half life is up in the Siberian plateau. 
a, a lovely quote I got from an interview. Um, and you'll have to excuse my translation of Russian. I'm not a fluent Russian speaker. KZ38 was drilled. It became scary. No one had ever heard of such powerful ores, either in the Union or in the world. And of course, 47 drill rigs are mobilized as a result um, of those sort of intersections. So to wrap up, I really want to give you a, a flavor of the hydrogeochemistry and the role that this plays, because it's really important. But before I pitch the hydrogeochemistry, I just want to show you what it's like between the discovery of Kalnak and Oktobriski. Every deposit that's been found in this region is in the top 400 meters. It's been found using surface prospecting and shallow exploration tools. So till geochemistry, a number of really amazing developments, but nonetheless all shallow tools. Every ore body that's been found to date up until 1965 is hosted in the Tunguska stratigraphy, not in the underlying rocks that we now know host Oktobriski. And every deposit has been found is oriented north-south, parallel to the norilsk karolak Fault. What's important is that Karolak breaks these rules. Um, I'd like to suggest it was great science, but in fact, it's part of a systematic program with these 47 rigs. They're drilling at 100 by 200 meter spacing. But what's important is what they did with those particular holes. By now, Victor Kratzhoff has become the chief geologist. He's 32 years old. And the man who leads the program, he's quite famous for the discovery itself. And KZ 584, so just for context, we were in the 21s with the discovery of Talmac, intersects fractured carbonate in the underlying um, sulfates and evaporites and carbonates. The water is monitored for a couple of, uh, of uh, and then analyzed for nickel, copper, uh, cobalt, chromium, zinc, and lead. There's not a lot of data from this period of time. This is a history account, but it's a quite an extreme enrichment. And then they deepen the existing 400 meter hole and it intersects the cupiferous ores that lie in the upper part of Octobriski. So uh, we just re briefly talked about the upper breaches that are in, uh, intercalated with the anhydrite that sit on the top of Octobriski, a very distinctive and very copper rich. Uh, and the KZ584 goes through those particular upper cupiferous rocks. But the important part about this role of hydrogeochemistry is this new Karolak intrusion in the Octobriski ore sits outside of the known Tunguska stratigraphy, the known prospects, and instead of being north-south oriented, it's oriented east-west. Classic story of unknowns. So I think that's all I've really got time for today. This is part of a far larger work, but just to frame it up with a couple of schematics, this is what the geology looks like prior to that hydrogeochemistry. So Palnac, Chonolith oriented in and out of the page coming towards you, lovely controlled by folds. And then this is what happens when we see the east-west Karolak intrusion. The important point I really wanna make in this schematic is the depths to the discovery of Karolak, the spacing of the holes, and really the fact that we're down in a different part of the stratigraphy. And this comes about because of the presence of, of hydrogeochemistry. So to finish up, um, the whole point of doing discoveries and stories isn't just for historical purpose. Um, there's a significant amount of hindsight bias that's told in discovery stories. It's not science, but it does allow us to reconstruct decision-making under extreme uncertainty, unlike forensic science. And so it does play a really important role. In fact, I would suggest it plays a more important role in geology in exploration strategy. So someone like myself, I'm very much a student of past discoveries. Some of you will know I run a podcast, which is in the bottom left hand of the screen there, called Exploration Radio, which really draws on stories like Norilsk. But just a point about hydrogeochemistry in closing. This is 1965, and the original 1937 surface work is taking place with detection limits that are 40, 50, 60 years old. And yet the world's single largest highest value deposit, Octobriski, of any type was found using 1965 detection limits. Things have gone a long way since then, but hydrogeochemistry is still a relatively uh, novel and uh, underused technology. And the second thing you'll notice about that is there's very little role for geophysics in this discovery, very much geology and geochemistry. So not a lot of detail in that talk. Uh, if anybody's interested, uh, I've noted the primary references. What do I mean by primary reference? A primary reference is written by the person who was involved at the time. Um, I'm not interested in, in accounts that are post 
Um, as I said, it's been a bit of a love of mine and obsession for 10 years to put this story together. But if anybody has any further primary references, then I'd love to hear from you um, as I'm really trying to close this down and put together um, a story that has never actually been put together of the whole account of the discovery of, of Norilsk. So I think I'll, I'll, call, I'll draw that to a close, Steve. Thanks.